And these are the days of Elijah, as we hear from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, the story of Elijah being received into heaven. Now the Lord was going to take Elijah up to heaven in a windstorm, and Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. And so they went down to Bethel. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't leave you. So both of them went on together. Fifty members of the group of prophets also went along, but they stood at a distance. And both Elijah and Elisha stood beside the Jordan River. Elisha then took his coat, rolled it up, and hit the water. And then the water was divided into two. Both of them crossed over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, what do you want me to do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, let me have twice your spirit. Elijah said, you've made a difficult request. If you can see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours. If you don't see me, it won't happen. They were walking along and talking when suddenly a fiery chariot and fiery horses appeared and separated the two of them. And then Elijah went to heaven in a windstorm. Elisha was watching and he cried out, Oh, my father, my father, Israel's chariots and its riders. And then he could no longer see him. Elisha took hold of his clothes and ripped them in two. Then Elisha picked up the coat that had fallen from Elijah. He went back and stood beside the banks of the Jordan River. He took the coat that had fallen from Elijah and hit the water. And he said, where is the Lord, Elijah's God? And when he hit the water, it divided in two. Then Elisha crossed over. We continue our sermon series today, Love Letters from Afar, as we read from the book of Galatians, the second chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. I am reading from the Common English Bible. We are born Jews, not Gentile sinners. However, we know that a person isn't made righteous by the works of the law, but rather through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. We ourselves believed in Christ Jesus so that we could be made righteous by this faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law, because no one will be made righteous by the works of the law. But if it is discovered that we ourselves are sinners while we are trying to be made righteous in Christ, then is Christ a servant of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild the very things that I tore down, I show that I myself am breaking the law. I died to the law through the law so that I could live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in my body, I live by faith, indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son, who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't ignore the grace of God, because if we become righteous through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Here ends the reading. The third scripture reading also comes from the book of Galatians, the third chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. 
Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed, so that the law became our custodian until Christ, so that we might be made righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now you belong to Christ. Then, indeed, you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Here ends the third reading. Now, I know that I have told this joke before, but let's see if you can remember the joke about the pastor who was talking with one of her Sunday school classes about what one has to do to get into heaven. Now, she wanted to see if the kids understood the concept, and so she said to them, if I sold my house and I sold my car and I had a great big garage sale and I gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? No, the children answered. Well, if I cleaned the church every day and I mowed the lawn and I kept everything tidy, would that get me into heaven? And again, the answer the children gave was a resounding no. Well, if I gave candy, candy to all of the children and I loved my husband, would that get me into heaven? And again, they answered no. Well, this pastor was just about to burst with pride for how well she had taught these children that getting into heaven is not about the things we do. So she asked, then how can I get into heaven? And a little boy way in the back shouted out, you have to die first. Oh, good, you remembered. <laughs> this whole idea of getting into heaven has occupied Christian thought for centuries. Not too long ago, a very popular writer and preacher by the name of Rob Bell wrote a book entitled Love Wins. And what he basically said in the book was, that God loves us through no merit of our own. In other words, there isn't anything that we can do to make God love us more than God already loves us. And there isn't anything we can do to stop God from loving us. God offers us grace and eternal life, period. And from that perspective, life is not about getting into heaven or avoiding hell, two topics that have over the centuries been greatly misunderstood and greatly misinterpreted. But rather, as Rob Bell argues, life is about living boldly. It is about loving boldly with all of the gratitude and all of the graciousness that we can muster. Because we are so loved and so accepted and so forgiven and so redeemed and embraced by God, then our lives should be a reflection of that kind of love. Life is not to be lived out of fear or 
or dread, it is to be lived out of love. You belong to God. So act like it. And when we do just that, when we act out of God's love, Rob Bell says, love wins. Well, when Rob Bell's book was published, there were a lot of Christians who were angry and upset at his book. Mostly it, that anger came from people who believed that Christian faith and theology are rooted in fear and punishment. For example, eat from the tree of life, mess up the garden, and you get yourself booted out of the garden. Engage in all manner of bad behaviors, and a flood will wipe you off the face of the earth. Engage in the worship of idols by dancing around a golden calf, and get ready to drink some pretty putrid water in the wilderness for a while. The Old Testament is full of stories that give us the impression that God is all about meeting out punishment when we don't show appropriate fear of God. And so lots of Christians believe to this day that the only way to get into heaven is to earn our way through those pearly gates. You know, it's funny because Jesus said nothing like that at all about heaven. Even when a lawyer asked him point blank one time, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered his question with another question of his own. What is written? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's right, said Jesus. And then to make sure that the lawyer got the point, Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan. Love wins. But we keep forgetting that, don't we? We keep forgetting that. We, we keep thinking that somehow this is all on us. That there is some code of conduct or some set of rules or some contract somewhere with boxes that we have to initial or a dotted line we have to sign in order for God to even deign to receive us into God's presence. This controversy has been around for years, centuries even. Mark Laberton, the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, has written in his book, The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor. God is at work on us, in us, through us, through the Word and the Spirit. We can participate in this process, opening ourselves to this change, seeking to be recipients of the change, but it is God doing the work. So Jesus says... It is not what you can do or are doing to be saved, but God working in and through you to bring about real transformation, to bring about heaven into our midst. In our scriptures from Paul's letter to the churches at Galatia today, the apostle is emphatic when he writes, we ourselves believed in Christ Jesus so that we could be made righteous by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law. Because no one will be made righteous by the works of the law. Now the truth is that for most of his life, especially his religious life, Paul approached religion like many have done. Too often, religion is about controlling people, keeping people in their places, telling them what to believe, how to live, or else God will punish them. 
This continues to be a real problem in our world. The oppressive and exclusive nature of religion. History and practices of religion that oppress and coerce, that manipulate and control people are long and tedious. As Alex Evans, a Presbyterian preacher, writes, it is little wonder that people who see and experience religion in this way run from it and fast. It's not possible to read Paul's letters and not be reminded where Paul came from on his long journey to Christianity. Before the man was a saint of the church, he was a persecutor of it, literally blinded by his own self-interest. And you can find that story in Acts 9. It took a powerful love on the part of Jesus to turn that man around and help him see straight. But love won. Love won. Love always wins. Although sometimes it just takes us a while to recognize that truth. In today's scripture, Paul once again is reminding the churches at Galatia that they are free people in Christ Jesus. Now remember, as we've been going through this sermon series, remember that there are people from the Jerusalem church, the Jewish Christian church, who have come to Galatia preaching another gospel, as Paul calls it. A gospel that is rooted in Mosaic law. A gospel that said, if you do this, God won't like it, so make sure that you do this and this and this and this. And the list went on and on and on. Rather than being rooted in love, the love of God, the love of neighbor, the other gospel was rooted in rules and laws and boxes to be initialed and dotted lines to be signed. It inspired fear rather than faith. It was rooted in punishment rather than freedom. And it declared most strenuously that God's love had to be earned, that in order to be redeemed, to have eternal life, we had to curry favor with God. I like how Eugene Peterson translates Paul's words in the message. Until the time we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by Mosaic law. The law was like those Greek tutors with which you are familiar who would escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, making sure that the children would really get to the place they set out for. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. The law, says Paul, was like a nanny until we were old enough to know better. Do you remember when your parents used to tell you that? You're old enough to know better. Remember that? That's how life was under Mosaic law, with its 600 and some rules to be obeyed. But through Christ Jesus, that changed. God did something new. Decided to love us first and best so that we could learn to love back 
love back God, love back our neighbors in the same way. So that we would grow up, become an adult in our faith. And the symbol of our coming of age is our baptism. We are washed, we are cleaned up, we are dressed anew so that we can take our place in the community and be the adults in the room. Now, does that mean that we throw out all of the rules when it comes to Christian faith and behavior? No, of course not. But it does mean that the way that we live in community with each other, not just within these walls, but outside of them as well, the way we live in community with each other comes from a different perspective. I have a really good friend who has been my sister in Christ for many, many years. And whenever I get to whining about my life or about my job or about my family, my friend just looks me in the eye and says with a very strong Memphis accent, put on your big girl panties and deal with it. <laughs> now, I love that woman. I swear I love that woman. Do you have people like that in your life? Do you have people like that in your life? I think we all need those kind of people in our lives, don't we? Don't we? We need them. I love my friend dearly because she inspires me and because I know she's right. And that is the point that Paul makes this morning with the Galatians and, yes, even with us. To be a Christian is... Well, to borrow my friend's phrase, put on our big girl or our big boy pants and deal with whatever comes our way. With all of the love and the grace and the forgiveness that we can muster. Because it is how God deals with each and every one of us every single day of our lives now that Jesus has come into the world. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law, locked up. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. Faith isn't about rewards and punishment. That kind of thinking only leads us to fear. And my friends, there is enough fear-mongering going on in the world today. All kinds of despicable things happen in this world when our fear gets whipped into a frenzy. We treat each other badly. We become suspicious and demeaning of one another. We become overprotective of what's mine and what's yours. We become threatened by differences, sometimes murderously so. We assume the worst about each other rather than the best. And we act on those false assumptions. That's not faith, says Paul. And it's not Christian. Did you notice in the Hebrew Testament lesson for today that there is also something being said on this matter? The prophet Elijah is carried home to God, and on the banks of the Jordan River, his companion, that prophet in training, Elisha, has to decide what he will do next. The story says that Elijah's coat or mantle fell to the ground when the prophet was swept up into heaven. And at the water's edge, Elisha has to decide. Will he take up that mantle? Will he take up that coat? Will he put on the clothes of the prophet? 
and be the next adult in the room to lead God's people. I've said it before, and I will continue to say it throughout this sermon series. Paul's letter to the Galatians is the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. But that freedom comes with a price, my friends. For all of us to be one in Christ Jesus requires hard work, and it requires great sacrifice, and it requires great commitment. Christian freedom, real freedom in Christ, requires that we let go of our nanny-styled theologies and our beliefs about God. Theologies and beliefs rooted in fear and punishment and control. Theologians, theologies that exclude and demean, that strong-arm and intimidate, that oppress and separate real christian freedom requires a grown-up faith that invites each of us to be the adults in the rooms of the world adults who are rooted in love with the courage and the conviction to live out what Jesus most wanted us to bear witness to in this world. The love of God and the love of neighbor. Because you see, in the end, love wins. Love always, always.